Jing Liu is back to prove that revenge is still best served cold. <laughs> and today, I will tell you how to build her best. On top, I'll later talk about her pull value and how she stacks up against Ankaron, and for those of you who have her already, if you should go for her Light Cone or Eidolons, and how to upgrade her best. Now, let's get into it. Jing Liu's relics are one of a kind. Oh my god! Her signature set, Glacial Forest, is not even the strongest set in the list. It tails on rank 2 slightly behind Genius of Brilliant Stars when it's at its best. The ice damage bonus and the 25% crit damage it gives are nothing to sneeze at. But if you're not intending to get the wind set too, then it feels kinda sad to farm for it. And it doesn't get any better of Genius of Brilliant Stars. The set is great if you face quantum weak enemies, but if not, it falls behind the competition by quite a substantial margin. So both of these sets are only good if you own them already. But if you have to farm from scratch, then you don't need to go for any of these. The best buying for your buck would be to farm two-piece diver and combine that with either two-piece musketeer or two-piece messenger, and you will not need to step a foot into the ice or quantum domains. The damage with these combos is not just it's all right levels, it's actually close enough. It will save you a crap ton of time and trailblaze power as you're not forced to farm a full working four piece. If you somewhere have a good two piece glacier in your mother's basement that's untouched, then you can combine that with two piece diver, so that works too. Hopefully we'll get better four piece sets to farm for Jing Liu that are more worthwhile in the future. Now for the two piece sets. You actually have no reason to farm anything else other than Rudolent Arena. It's ahead of the competition by a substantial amount, and Simulated Universe 7 gives you a pretty good secondary set being Broken Keel, which is very high in demand for any crit team. If you already own a good two-piece Inert Salsado set, you can use that and call it a day. The Glamoth and Space Ceiling Station will perform similarly, but if you ever want to play Sparkle in your team with Jing Liu, she won't be able to clear the speed requirements these sets have, and so they just become cope. Use them if you have them, but swap them out eventually for Rudolent Arena pieces. For those wondering, if you play Sparkle with pretty much any DPS, you want to swap their speed boots out for attack boots. Jing Liu is not very complicated with her main stats. For her body, she always wants a crit damage one. You get so much free crit rate in her empowered state that you would overcap too easily if you went for a crit rate body. For her boots, you always want speed unless you play with Sparkle, then you have to switch for attack boots. Going with the wrong boots here at any time will make her damage feel sad, and you too. For her balls, you want to go with ice damage, but attack percent is acceptable, albeit slightly weaker, so it comes down to substats. For her rope, you certainly want attack percent. Jing Liu, in terms of crit, is very different. You never want to exceed 50% crit rate on her. In fact, you're already good at 25% crit rate, as that combined with the crit from her Ultra Instinct mode gets you to 75%. You also do not need a ton of attack percent in her substats. Some is okay, but note that the lion's share of her attack comes from her talent, like 2000 attack plus she gets on top of what she already has. So get crit damage, and as much as you can. In terms of speed, you want to stick around 135 to 137, it's not 134, as that is reserved if you want to play with Branya. But also prepare a, a pair of attack boots if you want to play with Sparkle. If you want some attack percent here and there, it's fine. You do need to have something in your relics after all. Jing Liu is not a picky eater when it's about light cones. At least here, she gives us a break. You can still go for her signature light cone. I shall be my own sword. sword. Which is one heck of a cool name, to be frank. But luckily, you don't need it. Her second best option is a free-to-play weapon and is within 90% of its power level. That being said, it has some decent base and gives you 20% crit damage without asking for anything. On top, you get 42% damage increase, a 12% defense ignore, when you've got all three of her stats. Now to the winner. It's no surprise fall of an Eon at S5 is so good. You get that cone from her to shop, and it will give you up to 64% attack with its passive that needs to be stacked. So on average, it's like a 32% increase. If you manage to break even one enemy with your team members present, Jing Liu also gets a 24% damage increase. With proper elemental coverage, this is a condition that should be easy to fulfill, as there's always some small fries that you can knock out real quick. Star Rail is quite an AoE game, and even bosses will almost always summon little guys next to them. 
With this Lycone, there is actually no need to go for anything else on Jingliu because it's free. However, there are other cones that perform good enough to be considered as well if you happen to own them. That would be Under the Blue Sky, Something Irreplaceable, or Secret Vow, and Nowhere to Run. All of them are good enough to be used as well. As for Jingliu's teams, the best playstyle for most of you will be running her as a hyper carry with two harmony units and a sustain. The goal is to get her as often as possible into her ultra instinct mode and buff the living heck out of her. If you need a refresher about her transmigration state, which is a really cool name, you can look up in the talent section if you need a refresh. Alright, let's cover some of her best duo support cores for Jingliu first. The right combo of harmonies or debuffers with their respective build make up a massive difference. So I'm not only going to show the cores, but also their gear and speed against a 3-cycle MOC 12 chamber with 3 targets. Note that the numbers I put into the tables are done at E0 levels for 5 stars and E6 levels for 4 stars. Similar is true for light cones. However, the 4 stars should be looked as a goal to reach, so not having certain 4 stars at E6 or S5 doesn't mean you're excluded from playing a core. Same is true for the light cone super impositions. Now with that out of the way, let's start with Ruan Mei. So, she has a great package of goodies, like her damage increase and weakness break efficiency, resistance penetration, delays, speed increase, and so on. If you got her, great for you, you've got a golden ticket. She enables some of Jing Liu's best teams. Her entrance clearly shifted the rankings of the best supports to use of Jing Liu. So if you wonder why some combos are just down, <laughs> Silver Wolf, <laughs> it's not just because they got worse all of a sudden, it's just that better options are now available. Her best partners in crime to create the ultimate enhancer duo for Jing Liu are Branya, Sparkle, Ting Yan, and Pella in that order. Ting Yan absolutely races through with 160 or more speed. And wherever she is, Dance 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 is not far away. In fact, you'll find that light cones in teams that feature her or Sparkle will usually have DDD. Ruan Mei and the Bellabog Princess, Branya. It's not just a great combo, they literally sit at the very top of the damage charts with a considerable lead to the rank 2. For this combo, you do not need cons or S1 on Branya. The only light cone that you need is Memories of the Past to S1 or higher, for one May or her signature, of course. Branya will be fine with Past and Future, which you can also refine for free. The most important thing to consider with this core is that you want to have a DPS go first before Branya so that Branya can pull him up again. You can achieve that by making your DPS one or more speed faster than Branya, who can sit at 134 speed. Ruan Mei should be faster than both of them, ideally 143 or more so that she can do her thing. Speaking of Branya, this girl occupies rank 1 and 2 on these charts, and that is not just for the advanced forwards that allow every carry to go twice per cycle, but also for the massive damage, attack, and crit damage buffs she gives to Jing Liu. She also cleanses whatever debuffs was on Jing Liu. On top, she's almost as easy to get as Dr. Ratio. If you don't lose to her, which in of itself is a huge dub, you can get her from your free standard 5-star selector if you haven't already chosen that. So everybody who didn't just start playing yesterday should have a Bronya by now. No excuses. She tangos the hardest with Sparkle and the mentioned Ruan Mei. If you don't own them or can't spare any of them, then the true, untested Ting Yang will be your default option. Pella also works with Bronya, but the results will be weaker compared to Ting Yun Bronya. Okay, Sparkle, it's your turn. The Sparkle Bronya combo is a particularly interesting one. It's the second strongest on the charts. The regular combo where you play Jing Liu first into Bronya and then back into Jing Liu gets changed. Now Sparkle pulls up Jing Liu and then Bronya pulls Jing Liu. On top, Sparkle tells Jing Liu to get rid of her speed, Mosakins, and slip into comfy attack boots. You can keep Bronya at 134 speed as long as your Sparkle is faster. And with faster, I mean 160 speed, man. It starts kind of working at 150 and upwards, but at 160, she is guaranteed to pull up Jing Liu right away. But it doesn't end her selfish demands. While this tiny gremlin can go with past and future similar to Bronya, she pops off way harder when you put an S5 dance 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 into her hands. If you end up putting both Ting Yun and Sparkle into one core, then keep the DDD on Sparkle and give Ting Yun meshing cogs. Sparkle herself is definitely an interesting newcomer, and it isn't surprising that a unit has a lot of overlap with Branya can perform really well. In fact, occupying rank 2 to 4 at the top. She's absolutely packed and adds a bazillion buffs onto Jing Liu teams, like a ton of crit damage, damage bonus, skill points, and an advance forward. With all that being said, if you can run her with Branya or Mei, she will be great. 
Tingyun and Pella do work with her as well, with Tingyun being better than Sparkle, and remember to put that pesky DDD on Sparkle. While Tingyun is still to this day a very strong support, with all her combos occupying the top half of the charts except the one where you put her together with Pella. The core is just simply not worth going for unless you don't really have any 5 star supports to boot, which would be weird after a year. It's just better to use her with one of the three goats, Mei, Sparkle, or Branya. Her attack buff isn't anything crazy as Jingliu gives herself nuclear crap tons of it, but the energy restoration and massive damage buff is very appreciated. Also, Benediction does its fair share of damage on, on units that it augments. Now, Pella's an interesting case. Her A4 is good value in buffing ice damage, which comes on top of her shredding enemy defenses in an AoE fashion. She is very strong, but you can see combos of any unit tailing of those Ting Yun. Jingliu just seems to mingle better with Harmony units. Surprise! And a very similar thing is true for Silver Wolf. Actually, it's kind of worse for her. Even her highest spot, Ruan Mei, is less than mid, which is not surprising in three target scenarios. However, most hard content is forced on cracking down one or two very tough opponents that will occasionally summon some small fries next to them, which can die relatively quick. So she'll do her thing there. But even considering that, Silver Wolf just cannot reach the levels that Harmony units can achieve. And it gets worse considering the expense to get her. Pretty sad. Other harmonies like Asta and Yukong, I can't recommend. Especially Asta. She's too iffy to play and it gets straight up anti-synergistic with Bronya. The only thing you can do is using her ultimate in before the Bronya Jingliu duo in order to advance them enough to get extra actions out of them. But that setup is iffy and you won't even be able to use Asta's skill here. Yukong has her own sort of problems, she just doesn't mesh well with Jing Liu enough to justify her usage despite having great buffs under her belt. But her clunkiness is a general problem of this unit, not just a Jing Liu thing. Okay, now let's look at the scenario of dual DPSs. Since Jing Liu herself isn't too freaky about skill points, she can be used with quite a few of them. However, Blade to this day is still the one with the most synergy as he gets to trigger his talent often from Jing Liu's life leeching. The damage output was fine, like 4 or 5 months ago, but now it's just below mid. It cannot even compete with just running Bronya Tingyun with Jing Liu. And while Blade benefits from Jing Liu, Jing Liu has no benefits from pairing up with Blade. And in the meantime, the additions of Sparkle and especially Ruan Mei make this expensive but mid team look atrocious in comparison. Now to the sustained units. You can pretty much play anyone. However, some of the cores I mentioned are hard on the skill points. So units like Gallagher, Best Boy Adventurine, Ho Ho, Locha, Fushuan, or Japard are great. Japard, you will need to be paying extra attention to him, but you don't run out of shields and then get hit in your face as you miss White Hair Vampire isolated with a red Psycho Eyes. It will add extra pressure on top of everyone that wants to kill your team. Lynx is a double-edged sword, as she might get your very squishy Jing Liu knocked out with her taunts, so use something else if you can. Also, the recently added Best Boy Adventurine is, of course, a pretty solid option with Jing Liu. Now, let's refresh some of your memories about what Jing Liu actually does before we talk about our legendary battle versus Acheron for pull value and vertical investment strategies. So, how does she work? For Jing Liu, it's all about her skills. If you're a sane Jing Liu main, if such a thing even exists, her normal attack should never see a day of light. So don't even level them. Her skill is where it's at, or better, the empowered version of it. As by itself, Transcendent Flash is just a plain old single target spell that deals ice damage. It also generates so-called Sigisy stacks after the attack end. Once you get at least two of them, the skills get promoted to the Moon Glacial River Enhanced skill. Now, the skill is turned into a blast and has its multipliers improved. Not by much, but it's bigger. But that's not all that's happening when Jing Liu gets these two stacks. Her biggest transformation comes from her Crescent Transmigration state. What it does is turn on her Ultra Instinct Beast mode. By the way, that ability has one cool name. Jing Liu's just really cool. Oh, I'll see myself out. It advances her action by 100% and gives her up to 50% crit rate. What advancement means here is that the moment you use her skill to get her second stack, you will get another turn right away, which allows you to use her empowered state without any waiting. So it's as if her downtime is only one turn and not two. Especially the crit rate part. That's insane. In this state, she will now only use her enhanced skill instead of a regular one. And of course, you can still use her ultimate too. But Vampire Lady will show her true IPC colors and tax your team for their blood whenever she is asked to attack in this state. She will sip 4% of your teammates max HP, 
and she knows no mercy for them until there is nothing but one HP left. But you know, with great blood taxes come great powers, or however the saying goes. Thank you. What I mean is that Jinglio's attack will greatly increase by 540% of the total HP consumed from your team. And the cap for this buff is at 180% of Jinglio's base attack. This is massive. But before you can go and stack HP on everyone, note that the cap is reached much earlier before you can max out the HP to attack conversion. Light combs with higher base attacks can offset that to your favor, but it's not worth to get a headache over that. And just note that you can easily get 2000 to 2300 attack from that conversion, on top of what she already has. This is the reason why Tingyun's attack buffs look laughably tiny if you compare it to that monstrosity. Now if Jing Liu juiced up like a bodybuilder on the nastiest roid you can imagine, it becomes painfully clear that she wants to use her ultimate exactly inside her Ultra Instinct mode. If only the AI understood this. Everything else would just be a colossal waste. The ability is a blast dealing some decent ice damage and will give you a stack towards your empowered state for using it. If you add 2, which starts her thingy, the burst will now get you to 3. With 3 stacks under her belt, you can now use her Ultra Instinct for 3 turns, with each turn removing a stack. Once all her stacks are consumed, Jing Liu is going to automatically exit the mode and she will spend the next turn being a regular Saiyan without any greedy blood taxing whatsoever. Her technique is pretty handy as it creates a zone outside of the combat that will freeze enemies. It lasts 20 seconds, or until you actually enter combat. Once you are inside the action, you get 15 energy restored on your Jing Liu and start the battle one stack already under her belt, which means she can use Ultra Instinct right away. The technique also has a 100% base chance to freeze enemies at the beginning of combat for one turn, on top, for being frozen, they also get an espresso-sized chunk of damage with skills of 80% of Jing Liu's attack. Of course, like everybody else, she comes with some smaller but very useful traces. Her Ascension 2 gives her 35% effect res, which makes her a little more resilient against DOTs and crowd control. Cool. Ascension 4 gives her a 10% advance forward for using her normal skill, and Ascension 6 gives you a big hit to use her damn ultimate inside her Ultra Instinct state by giving it a free 20% damage boost. Also, worthwhile mentioning that she gets speed from her traces, which is kinda rare, and to top up her damage, she gets a bunch of crit damage gifted, which complements her free crit rate from her talent swimmingly. In regards to talent priority, you want to level her skill and talent equally. These two are the most important thing. Then you can go with her, her ultimate. Don't bother with her normals. Now with the introduction of newer units, you might be curious how well Jing Liu can stack up against the likes of Acheron, who is now celebrated as THE Apex Predator of Honkai Star Rail, the pinnacle and Mount Everest of damage. So I ran some more numbers to see how they compete at low, mid, and high investment. At low investment, I ran purely 4-star characters and light cones in their teams, all this stuff you can get as a free-to-play. At that level, even with an S5 from Mata, which is a comparatively worse light cone than S5 Eon is on Jing Liu, Akron and her team still ended up putting 50% more damage out than Jing Liu's free-to-play team, so it's 975k versus almost 1.5 million damage over 3 cycles. This is a pretty big difference, and whoever said Akron is not free-to-play friendly should reconsider her stance. Her damage is roughly enough to clear in about 3 cycles when thinking about the highest floors in MOC. With Jing Liu within a free-to-play setting and that damage, it can get rough, but you should be able to clear in 5 cycles. Before you judge, I have to say that on Acheron's side, Pella needed to have that S1 Pearls of Sweat. Without that, Acheron's team falls down to 1.14 million damage, which is only 70% stronger than Jing Liu's. But is it unreasonable to assume that a free-to-play can never get a single copy of a 4-star in a whole year of dedicated playing? Who knows? You tell me. Anyways, when you dial up that investment, that's when Jing Liu starts catching up a bit with Acheron. A bit investment, we do now have another 5 star character and a couple S5 4 star light cones in the team. Akron gets Black Swan and Jing Liu gets Ruan Mei. The difference shrinks down to now 40% more damage in favor of Acheron, but it's still substantial. Now, how about 3 5 star units per team with all being E0 S1? So, Bronya Mei for Jing Liu, with Sparkle, Pella, and Welt for Acheron. Now, that's when Jing Liu starts closing in. Acheron is still 21% ahead, but the difference has shrunk significantly. I must say that Welt Sustain is really whack to play, so take this comparison with a grain of salt. Personally, I do like Black Swan Kafka a lot more, even if it means that Black Swan turns into a normal attack bot with occasional bursts. But who knows how things will shake up for Akron and Jing Liu once Pella gets eventually power crept, ideally with some healing on top. 
but in general, at this point, with 2.8 million damage for Jing Liu's team and over 3.4 million for Acheron, we get into a territory where it just stops mattering as they will both stop the content. The bottom line here is that Jing Liu is not as friendly anymore to low investment compared to when she was introduced in October last year when MOC was done at floor 10. But don't get it twisted, she isn't bad by any means, she just needs more work. In fact, she's still considered S tier and is, in my opinion, still one of the top three best DPSs in the game. She is the second best falling behind Acheron. And my point here is to visually illustrate how things have changed over the year, but also that you show that you can still pull her and smash all content. Now, speaking of investment, if you're wondering whether you should go for E1 or S1 on your Jing Liu, my answer is get Ruan Mei. Bronya you can basically get for free anyway once you choose her from the free standard 5-star selector, and having them both is basically doubling your damage right out of the gate. So save for May first, and then once you got her, you can come back. Between E1 and S1, you need to consider a few things. The short answer is go for S1 over E1. The long answer is that her S5 Eon Light Cone is only 11% weaker than her signature, so the upgrade isn't that huge there. The E1 against multiple targets is only a minor increase of 24% crit damage to your enhanced skill and burst. But once you've eliminated all the small fries and are left of a single boss, that's where it unlocks its full power. You'll get on top a whole 100% attack scaling to your attacks in Ultra Instinct mode. This is quite a big increase as your enhanced skill usually has a 250% multiplier and your burst a 300% one. But all in all, it will be a 38% increase from E0 in such a case. And here comes the big, big butt. Without the extra multipliers, it will only be a mere 5% increase in damage. So the E1 will only be good in helping you deal with the last remaining boss of a difficult chamber, and will be bad against anything else. For that reason, you're better off with S1 first and then going for Eidolons. Speaking of Eidolons, let's cover the rest of them quickly. But I can tell you right now that if the major ones are E1, E4, and E6, naturally. At E6, you will have double the damage if and only if you deal with a single enemy, gets multiple, we have 57% increase from E0. Alright, E2 gives Jing Liu an 80% damage increase to her next empowered attack after using her ultimate. It will end up being a roughly 5% total damage increase from her previous Eidolon. E3 levels up her talent and ultimate by 2, another 5% increase. E4 gives a 90% increase to your HP to attack conversions. You get from 540% to 630%, which isn't crazy by itself because of the cap. But the cap itself also gets a 30% increase, which is actually shifting the needle, an 11% increase of her damage. E5 raises her skill, talent by 2 points, a 7% increase. E6 increases the stack limit by 1 when you enter Ultra Instinct mode, and also gains a stack at the same time. On top, she gets 50% crit damage and a 13% total increase to her damage. Jing Liu might have already felt the passing stands of time. You just need a little more work to get her going, but she is still S tier for a good reason and is the second best DPS in the game. A very strong and capable crowd DPS that will last you for a while, just don't drop the cheapest investment on her and wonder why you struggle. She's a hyper carry after all. Well then, this has been Juice, signing out, and I wish you all a day as insanely cool as Jing Liu. I'll see myself out.